Scripture reading today taking from Exodus 7, 1 to 6, and Revelations 8, 1. Exodus 7, 1 to 6, and Revelation 8, 1. Exodus 7, 1 to 6. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of, this, of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multi multiply my sign and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not hit you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people to children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am a Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded him. So they did. Revelations 8.1 When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us give thanks to God for being able to worship Him on this blessed day of the Lord. And I pray that God will pour out upon each and every household and family and individual that is worshiping God today. And last week through our church anniversary video, we were able to see some of our family members and our church members and how uh, how they worship at home together. And it was a great blessing, especially to see how different departments are giving so much effort and so much time in making uh, every service possible from our Sunday school service, our, our education departments, and our main services, Wednesday services, all the meetings. I believe that God is truly pleased with us, and I believe that God will give great blessings upon Zion Church and every family. Today, I'd like to continue on and finish the remainder of the plagues in Egypt. And uh, I'm not covering every detail. Uh, the details are in the eighth book in the History of Redemption series, the fulfillment of the Covenant of the Torch. Even the dates and the calculations of the dates from the plagues to Exodus to the wilderness journey and so on. But today, I'm going to go through quickly uh, for of the rest of the plagues from the 4th to the 10th. And uh, hopefully we will, in the near future, we will be able to focus more on the judgments in Revelation, the judgments of the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And we can find most of these plagues taking place and, and repeating in those judgments. So hopefully we will be able to spend some time Last time we studied about the first three plagues and the first plague, the turning of the water of Nile into blood was a solemn reminder of the wages of sin, how corruption reached all the way to the very basics, a very source of life. And then the second plague, the appearance of the frogs in Revelation, we see the unclean spirits from the dragon's mouth, the beast's mouth and the false prophet's mouth, they are like frogs. And these frogs represent the spirits, unclean spirits of the devil, the Satan, the dragon in the end time. And they are affecting, they were affecting the beds and the bowls, of food bowls of the people of Egypt, people of the world today. And we related it to the influences and the philosophies of the beasts that appear in the end time in Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 13, the beast that gives the mark of the beast. And this I explained that uh, it's referring to the philosophies and doctrines and beliefs of the people, even the ways of life that's affecting the people today. And these unclean spirits come from the mouth of the beast. And in, in Genesis, what came out of the mouth of the beast? The serpent, the beast, gave the wrong teaching, wrong truth, or what seemed like the truth. And that's why 
in the even in the end, they are called false prophets. Prophets are supposed to speak the truth from the word of God, but they are false. And so the serpent gave that word, and in that word was his mind, his soul, and his spirit. And mankind received that word. Adam and Eve received that word, and their actions, which is called obedience, right? Hearing the word and following it is called obedience. Fulfillment of the word. Which word? Whose words did they fulfill? Whose words did they follow? Whose words did they obey? Last week, we talked a little bit about obeying the word of God, which is faith. In whose words did they have faith? They followed the words of the serpent because it attracted their greed and their des fleshly desires. And as a result, because they received the words of the serpent and the thoughts of the serpent, they rejected the word of God, which is the spirit of God, the breath of life. And as a result, every mankind, every person that is born afterwards in that bloodstream and blood lineage is stained with sin. And as soon as we are born, we are faced, we are racing towards death. And that's the wages of sin. And the third, we talked about the gnats, like lice or, or mosquitoes. And these come from the dust afar, re referring to the being or, or mankind that do not have the spirit of God, that do not have the breath of life. And up to the second plague, the sorcerers and magicians of Egypt were able to mimic and imitate. But from the third, they could not. And they recognized that this is the power of God, according to Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. And then the fourth plague was the plague of the flies. And this, from this fourth plague, God is distinguishing the Israelites into the land of Goshen, where... This, these plagues will not affect them anymore. And so the first plague was the judgment. I mentioned that these plagues are judgments of God upon the gods of Egypt, proving to the Egyptians and to the Israelites that these gods are not gods. These gods that human beings made out to and worshipped and followed were nothing, useless. And the first plague was judging the god of Hapi. Hapi was a spirit of the Nile. And Osiris was another big god in Egypt. And they believed that Nile was its bloodstream. And the frogs, they believed, came, from, came out from Nile. And so in relation to the god of Hapi, also... Uh, another god called Hecht, both related to fertility. And then the third plague judged the god of Egypt named Seb, the earth god of Egypt. And this fourth plague, plague of the flies, Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32, the Egyptians worshipped a god named Uachit. Uachit was the fly god of, of Egypt. And this fly god, and also in the New Testament, Jesus mentions Beelzebub and also Beelzebul. And these are originally the gods or the king of the flies, uh, according to the meaning of uh, original language. And he is referring to the devil. And so the flies represent the spirit of the devil. And they come in swarms. And these flies are not just little tiny fruit flies. They are huge dung flies that can harm you when it comes in swarms. And flies come from dirty things like manure, dung, or decaying food, rotten food. In Hebrew, the word signifies literally mixture, being akin to the term mixed multitude. There, were, there was a mixed multitude among the Israelites when they were coming out of Egypt. And they are the ones that caused grumblings and complainings and uh, reminded them of how good the food of Egypt was. It was the mixed multitudes, the rabble. And these swarms were made up of not only flies, according to some scholars, 
but variety of insects. And these swarms of flies devoured, according to Psalm 78 verse 45, they did the work of devouring. And so these, uh, thinking about these mixed multitudes that were grumbling, there are mixed multitudes among us and more specifically in our hearts that start to grumble and start to pinpoint on the things that I don't like. And from our hearts come these, this rotting smell. And, and when it, we open up our mouth of grumbling and complaining, this odor is spreading forth. And you know how flies come from these decaying things and dungs? It's because when we don't see it, flies come and lay egg. And they become maggots and they grow to become flies. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 tells us, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's the heart that is decaying with sin when we cannot get rid of sin. See, when you cannot get rid of your, your waste, it will start decaying inside and it will cause harm to you, your body. Likewise, when sin is not taken away, when we do not repent of sin, that sin will decay and it will kill us. And from that decaying sin comes the flies, evil spirits and evil thoughts and words that will cause the whole environment, uh, all, even the people around us to be affected. You know, people that like to gossip, they come to they, they gather together like flies. When, when there's smell of dung or smell of rotting food, they will go over there and start munching on it, start laying eggs. And that's how sin spreads. Jesus gave a parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 and the following, about the owner, master, and the servants sowing the good seed in the field. But at nighttime when they were sleeping, the devil comes and sows the tares. Likewise, flies come and sow the seed of disobedience, seed of grumbling into the hearts of the people, and they start to grow. And then the fifth plague is pestilence. Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And it was a disease on the cattle, on the livestock, on the animals. I will read chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. The Egyptians used to even worship their animals. And that's why they did not like, that's why Pharaoh did not like the fact that the Israelites wanted to take their cattle and their herds and flocks together with them to worship and to sacrifice them. And also the, their herds and their cattle signified their labor. And Proverbs chapter 21 verse 4 tells us that God considers the plowing of the wicked as sin. And so God is tying their hands. They cannot farm anymore without these flock, without these animals. And furthermore, these beasts represent their gods, Hathor and Ammon, Egyptian gods associated with bulls and cows. We can see that even this even affected the Israelites. When they were at Mount Sinai, they made a golden calf. And this was one of their gods that would lead them, that would prop, uh, bless them with prosperity. But in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2, it says, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his beast. This can apply to the boils, which is the next plague. But this mentions that these sores came upon the people who had the mark of the beast. Similar thing is this is a judgment and plague upon beasts, whether spiritual or physical. 
In Egypt, it was physically the beasts, literal beasts, animals. But in the end, those who have the mark of the beast, those who have the spirit of the beast, they are considered like beasts because they have the spirit of the beast. And so these judgments will come upon those who have the spirit of the beast, those who have taken on the image of the beast. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible men and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We were created in the image of God, but professing to be wise, we became fools and exchanged the image of God with the image of the beast. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And then the sixth, the boils. Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. Also, these boils are given to those who who have the mark of the beast. And the Egyptians worshipped and gods and goddesses of epidemics, gods of healing. Sekhmet is the god uh, goddess of epidemics. So uh, supposedly protects the Egyptians from all these epidemics and uh, viruses and diseases. Serapis and Imhotep were the gods of healing. This was the first plague that started to affect directly affect the people of Egypt. Up to now, it was the, the nature, the animals, and the food, and so on. But now, it's uh, affecting the people. Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 9, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky, in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beasts through all the land of Egypt. And this kiln is like a furnace, and some scholars say that this furnace was used to uh, sacrifice animals and sometimes even people. And this was done by the priests to give offering to their god named Typhon or Typhon to propitiate, to satisfy this God so that he would stop all these plagues. So there's a saying that uh, they, these priests were doing that, taking the sut from the furnace, throwing it into the air, asking this God Typhon or Typhon to stop, to help them stop these plagues. And God tells Aaron and Moses to do the same thing to cause more plagues, and this time, more severe. These boils, boils are uh, diseases on the body, and that causes blistering uh, all throughout the body. And it also speaks about epidemics, viruses. And the next is hail, Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 35. And this becomes even more serious. Exodus chapter 9, verse 18, it says, Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hail, such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. It's not just little things that fall, but very heavy hail. In Revelation, through the judgments, you see hail coming down several times. And Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, it says, The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21, And huge hailstones about a talent, about 100 pounds each, 
came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. That one talent is about 50 kilograms. Imagine the speed that it falls down with from heaven, 50 kilogram hail, not only one, but falling down like rain. And it says that it is hitting people in Revelation. And imagine when this thing hits a person, there is no more trace of that person left. Even everything around will be destroyed, like a bomb falling down. And this plague judged the Egyptian sky goddess named Nut or Nut, and the Egyptian agriculture deities named Isis and Seth. And this almost changes the heart of Pharaoh, but he changes it back. His heart is hardened again. Now this is affecting people, animals, the crops, the field, destroying the houses and buildings, everything. And then the next plague is the locusts. Exodus chapter 10 verses 1 through 20. And this plague of the locusts is like a combination of all the plagues that has happened so far. It's not only destroying everything, it's eating up everything. Once the, this storm uh, of locusts pass by, there's nothing left. Everything is destroyed. The ecosystem is destroyed. The farming is completely destroyed. Not only affects the, the economy, the food, the lives, but everything. And we see this happening today in different parts of the world. And this locust appears in Revelation. Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Locust comes up out of the abyss with a power as of the scorpions, and it has the sting of the scorpions, and it was told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor the green things, or the trees, but men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill them, but sting them to torment them for five months. And these people, they would rather die, but they cannot die. It's a taste of hell on this earth. And they have, these locusts have their uh, king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon. And this plague was a judgment upon the Egyptian deity of protector from locusts named Serapia or Serapis. And ninth, the darkness. Exodus chapter 10 verses 21 through 29. This plague was especially a great shock and terrifying to the Egyptians. During that time, the Egyptians, what they feared the most was chaos and darkness, interestingly. And that's exactly what God brought upon them. Remember Genesis chapter 1 verse 2? There was formlessness, void, and darkness. And that formlessness is chaos. And God, through the creation, puts everything into order. The thing is, judgment in the Bible is the reverse work, undoing of God's work of order, putting things in order, undoing of God's work of creation and redemption. And so those who are not good in the eyes of God are being destroyed. God is putting them back to chaos, disorder, and darkness. And that's what we see happening in Egypt. And so even in the end time, the judgment is undoing God's protection, un undoing God's work of redemption for the wicked ones. In other words, that God is taking away the protection from them. And once God's protection is taken away, removed, Satan will start to attack to no end, and they're vulnerable. So I pray that you and I will have that kafar, that covering of God. And in building Noah's Ark, 
God says to put kafar, pitch, on both inside and outside of Noah's ark. And that pitch, sap from the tree, represents the blood that comes from the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. May we be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood of Jesus Christ is the atoning blood, the blood of redemption. And that's the only way for us to be protected. And Jesus says, I am the light. While I am in this world, you have light. It is the day. There will come a night time when you will not be able to work. And that work, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 27 through 29, is believing in him. Our work that we need to finish is the work of believing in him so that we can assure salvation, that we can be sure of the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 also, says that the word is the light of mankind. And John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6 tells us that we are no more in darkness. And do not let that darkness cover us or affect us because we are not of night nor of darkness. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses, uh, verse 18 says, Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their hearts. May we not have that hardness of the heart. May we not ignore this message from God, from the Bible, that, that Jesus is the source of light and source of life. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And on the cross, according to Matthew 27, verse 45, Jesus went down into darkness to save us who are in darkness. And that darkness is in Hebrew, techum, which is abyss in the Greek version. Jesus, remember the, the locusts come out of the abyss, darkness come out of the abyss, May this darkness not affect us. The Israelites who are in Goshen, they had light, bright light. This darkness did not affect them. It says that this darkness was a complete darkness where they had to feel their way, way through. It's like they became blind, spiritual blindedness, ignorance just cannot see the truth of God's word. It comes upon those who reject it and ignore the word of God. After this plague is given to them, even if they want to see, even if they want to open their eyes, even if they want to understand it's too late, they cannot anymore. And that's why we need to take, we need to grab hold of the opportunity that is given to us. This plague was especially terrifying to the Egyptians because one of the greatest gods, the biggest gods that they believed in, was the god of the sun, the sun god named Ra. And God is telling them, your god of the sun cannot give light. In Revelation, the sun, moon, and the stars will lose their light. Who is your sun? Who is the source of light? Let us ask ourselves, in Revelation 22, in the New Jerusalem, in new heavens and earth, there is no need for the sun, moon, or the stars because Jesus, the light comes from Jesus. The light that God created on the first day, that light is constantly there, brighter than the sun. And then the last plague, something unique about the last plague, which is the death of the firstborns, in Exodus chapter 11, is that this plague, God did not use Aaron or Moses or their staff. God did it himself. And this plague is the ultimate, the, the climax, the final blow upon Egypt 
And this reveals and foreshadows the cross of Jesus, the atonement work, salvation work. At the same time, God is restoring his firstborns, restoring his children, because Satan had taken away and deceived his son, Adam. And now he's restoring his sons, Israelites. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, he says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And he's restoring them by striking the firstborns of Satan. Remember, Pharaoh represents Satan. Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I'm going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborns in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. In Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23, it says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And so I pray that you and I will become these spiritual sons of God, that the whole world, the whole creation eagerly waits for. As conclusion, after the Israelites entered into the land of Canaan, God gives blessings and curses. And the contents are the same. It's just that he gives, here there's blessing, they, these become blessings. Here, these become curses. And the curses are very similar to the plagues that were given to Egypt. So these plagues are not limited to only the Egyptians, but to those who receive these curses. And who will receive these curses? The blessings will be given to those who keep the word of God and remain as people and children of God. But the curses will be given to those who reject the word of God. Same thing from the Garden of Eden all the way until today. Those who keep the word of God and remain as people of God and children of God will be blessed. Those who reject the word of God and become children of the devil, they will receive the same kind of plagues and judgments. And that's, this continues on even until today into Revelation. And this is written in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verses 1 through 14 are about blessings. And verses 15 through 45 are about curses. And so let us compare. First plague was blood, water, judgment upon the water. Deuteronomy 28 verse 22. Smite you with fiery heat, mildew. And so the, the curse will be upon the waters. Second plague was the frogs. Deuteronomy 28 verse 17. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Remember the frogs went into the kneading bowls. And the third plague was gnats. Deuteronomy 28 verse 24. The Lord will take the rain of your land and powder and dust. The, remember the, du the dust turned into gnats. And the fourth plague was the flies. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 39. The worm will devour them. And this worm is in, uh, translated into, in Psalm 78, verse 45. Same word is used as swarms of flies. Fifth plague, pestilence. Verse 21, the Lord will make pestilence cling to you. Sixth, boils. Verse 27, the Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt and tumors. Verse 35, the Lord will strike you on the knees and legs with sore boils. And seventh plague, hail, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 16, cursed, cursed shall you be in the city and in the country 
which is fields. Hail ruined the field, right? Verse 18, cursed shall be the produce of your ground. And then locust, verse 38, for the locust will consume it. Verse 42, the crickets, the cricket shall possess all your trees and the produce of your ground. Darkness, verse 29, and you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness. And lastly, firstborn, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 18, Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. May the word of God be fulfilled in us. That's what obedience is. The word of creation, word of redemption, the word of life, taking place and working within our lives and being fulfilled. And when that happens, God said, and it was so, and God saw, and it was good. That is being fulfilled. May that take place in our lives. And that will turn us into children of God, sons of God. But if the word of God comes in and is rejected because of the other words and other teachings and doctrines and thoughts and greed that is filling up our hearts and taking up the throne of God in our hearts, then these judgments, these curses or plagues will come upon those people. And now let us compare and let us see where these plagues appear in Revelation. The seven trumpets and the seven bowls. See, the first trumpet, hail, comes. And then the third trumpet, water, turned to blood. Fourth trumpet, sun, moon, and the stars will lose their light, darkness. Fifth trumpet, pit of the abyss, which is also darkness. But from that darkness comes the locust. And then the sixth trumpet, death. And seventh trumpet, hail. And then the bowls. First bowl, boils. Third bowl, water to blood. Fourth bowl, sun, which is darkness. Fifth bowl, also darkness. Sixth bowl, the unclean spirits like frogs. And seventh bowl, hail. If you can see this chart, you can see some kind of parallel. Seven trumpets. And the seven bowls are covering the same area. First trumpet and first bowl, the earth. It will judge the earth. Second trumpet and second bowl will cover the sea. Third trumpet and third bowl covers the waters, rivers, and springs. The fourth trumpet and fourth bowl, sun, moon, and the stars. Fifth trumpet and fifth bowl, the source of the devil and Satan, the, the evil spirits, the abyss and the throne of the beast. Sixth trumpet and the sixth bowl, the river Euphrates. Seventh trumpet and seventh bowl, the completion. The difference is the trumpets will only harm like one third of the earth, one third of the sea, one third of the waters and so on. The intensity and the completeness of the judgment is different. The bowls will complete it. Common thing is these are poured out upon those who do not have the seal of God and the seal of the Holy Spirit, upon those who have the mark of the beast. Let us ask ourselves, are these things only future tense? Or are these things taking place in our life? Are the, do, do we see the aspects of sin and ugliness and uncleanness in this world already that are revealed through these plagues? And are these plagues already taking place? Then we need to ask ourselves, what kind of timings, what kind of timing are we living in? And in Revelation, in chapter 6, you see the six seals being broken. In chapter 5, there's a book, which is the Bible, sealed with seven seals. And every time this seal is broken, something happens. A sign of the end time, some kind of phenomenon takes place. And that is described in chapter 6 in Revelation. When the first seal is broken, a man riding on a white horse, white horse, in the image of the second coming Lord Jesus, later who comes in white horse. But then this one is false prophet, antichrist. Second one coming on a red horse, which represents wars. 
Third one coming in black horse, which represents famine. Fourth one, ashen horse, which represents death. What do you think? Are these things happening already? Are these things, are we waiting for these things to happen? Wars, famine, pestilence, death. Are these future tense? Are these something that we've never heard of? Something that will happen in the future? Is it because it's not affecting some of us directly that we are not thinking about these? These are the seven seals. It continues on. When the seventh seal is broken, it starts right away into the seven trumpets. It contains the seven trumpets within the seventh seal. And the seven trumpets are affecting the earth, the sea, the springs of water, and these plagues are taking place. Let us ask ourselves, are these seals taking place in our time already? As Jesus said, there will be wars. Nations will rise against nations. There will be pestilence, death. But that's not the end. And these plagues that we talked about, are these apparent in our lives, in this world? Then saints of God, people of God, what is the next thing that we need to do? And right before the seven trumpets start, chapter 8, verse 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, went up before God, out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds of flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And then seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. There's a short time, literally speaking, 30 minutes, but it is a symbolic period of time, emphasizing the shortness of it. But it is a time when the prayers of the saints are offered up to God. It's a time of silence, short time of peace, a short time of opportunity. It's a time when we make our choice. What is the thing that we as believers of God need to do if we are living in these times? What's next? May we be alert and awake, and may we truly prepare through prayer. May we truly prepare by receiving the word and receiving the hidden manna from Jesus Christ. And let us make sure that we are saved, that we are in the spiritual land of Goshen, which is Jesus Christ. Let us come into Jesus Christ. Let us come into this word so that we will be protected, so that we will be distinguished and set apart. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to be alert and awake. May we lift up our prayers and repentance so that as the earth, the sea, the rivers, even the sun, moon, and the stars come into disorder. Father, may we find the spiritual Goshen in your word. And may you, Jesus, become our rock, our hiding place, so that your people will be established. Rather than being put into disorder, formlessness, void, and darkness, may we be formed up together as the kingdom of God, and may we receive light and dwell in the midst of eternal light. May your people be able to find true life and hope and salvation. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.